All right, ladies and gentlemen, our first panel session for the day is titled Now and Next, The Evolution of the Creative Economy, where we will hear numerous perspectives on the advancement of the cultural and creative industry, also known lovingly as CCI, as a formalized economy. The panel will follow a hybrid format, so we'll have both in-person and virtual contributions. But first, we're going to hear from Her Excellency Rebecca Greenspan, Secretary General of UNCTAD, who was unable to join us live, but has the following video contribution to make. Her Excellency, Noura bin Mohammed al kaabi Minister of Youth and Culture, of the United Arab Emirates, distinguished delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to extend a very warm welcome to all of you at the World Conference on Creative Economy 2021 today. I am delighted to acknowledge all government ministers, high-level participants, academia, and creative and innovators from across the world. I would also like to share a heartfelt thanks to the government of the United Arab Emirates and the Ministry of Culture and Youth for hosting this conference. ANTAT is very honored to be your partner and we are committed to continue supporting these conferences which are so important for all of us who want to engage collaboratively on the future of the creative economy. As we near the end of the 2021 International Year of Creative Economies for Sustainable Development, it is time for this community to look closely on our progress, on our challenges, and on all of what we have learned and dealt with throughout this difficult year. This is also the ideal moment to set an agenda for the future, for a future where the creative economy builds momentum towards a resilient, inclusive and sustainable recovery. Many lives and many more livelihoods depend on us succeeding in this agenda. Cultural and creative industries contribute to roughly 3% of world GDP, generating almost $2.5 trillion annually, with exports of over $250 billion. 30 million people worldwide are employed by these industries, almost half of them women. These people work in many different things, from advertising to artificial intelligence, to public relations, to screenwriting, to basque weaving, from video games to theater, to hospitality, to coding, to consulting. The pandemic has revealed the importance of these jobs. We live in a world that is ever more complex and ever more digital. This increases the uptake and potential of cultural and creative industries everywhere. While you cannot replace handicrafts, walking through artisan markets, listening to live music, or engaging in cultural festivities, creative industries can bring life to the digital realm. All of us here have seen this. Culture makes the digital human. And only a digital world that is human can lead to sustainable development. As a result of rapid changes, the lines are blurring between industries and sectors, between tools and channels, and between markets and demand. The interaction of ideas, products, services, media, and the internet are becoming increasingly difficult to manage. But the potential of doing it successfully is immense. For that, we need to invest in digital infrastructures and do it in an inclusive way, a way that empowers people, leaving no one behind. Dear friends, 
there is now an urgency to come together and strengthen our partnerships and to develop and achieve resilience and diversity in these industries. ANCAT's work has elevated the creative economy on the world's economic and development agenda. The leadership of the United Arab Emirates has a wise vision to build a brighter future. This is really the perfect country to host this conference. <laughs> I am confident that this conference will encourage cross-cultural dialogue, amplify the global support and understanding of the creative economy, and build greater momentum in advancing a future that is more human and more dig digital, more inclusive and more prepared, more creative and more resilient. I wish you all the greatest success and I really thank you all. Friends, it gives me great pleasure to introduce this panel's participants. Please welcome to the stage our moderator, His Excellency Sheikh Salem Al Qasimi, the UAE's permanent delegate to UNESCO. And joining him virtually are Sylvie Forbin, Deputy Director General, Copyright and Creative Industry Sector at WIPO, and His Excellency Ernesto Atone Ramirez, Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We have a very exciting topic. We have our panelists from, from UNESCO and from, from WIPO. Thank you for being with us. Uh, just to give a brief introduction on the session, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome the panelists that we have uh, from two different yet interconnected global institutions. Today's conversation will focus on the advancement of culture and creative industries as a formalized economy with snapshots of the local and global impact for the creative economy and views of its fast future potential. I'm very pleased today to have with us virtually His Excellency Ernesto Ottoni, the <coughs> Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO, as well as Sylvie Forbin, the Deputy Director General for Copyrights and Creative Industries at WIPO. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I just want to start the session by asking a very general question to our panelists. What does a nation or a region need in a thriving creative economy? Your Excellency Ernesto, please, the floor is with you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would rather to be uh, with you uh, in Dubai, to be very frankly. As you know, uh, I couldn't be with you, but I'm very happy to be part of this, uh, this conference and this forum. Um, well, you know, and it was mentioned by, by Rebecca, the creative economy is one of the most rapidly growing sectors of the world economy. Uh, it has been mentioned that it is estimated in $2.2 billion, $250,000 in revenue, and it's created more than 30 million jobs worldwide. So the cultural and creative industry employ more people aged between 18 and 20 years than any other sectors. As millions of young people enter uh, into the work workforce every year, the cultural and creative industries have uh, the potential to create new jobs, foster innovation and sustainable growth patterns. Cultural and creative industries are also powering the digital economy with digital good, cultural goods generating the largest revenue for the digital economy. So creativity and the creation of creative hubs around the world are boosting city attractiveness, including to creative talents and highly skilled workers, those further contributing to local economic development. However, there are, and we speak every, especially this year of, uh, of um, the creative economy year, many challenges that are affecting the creative economy that will need to be addressed uh, if it is to achieve its full potential. One of the issues right now is the rise of digital technologies that have made the pirating of cultural content easier than ever. 
And uh, for example, I was in Ouagadougou uh, three weeks ago, and you can see that piratry in the audiovisual industries in Africa represent between 50 and 70% of all the incomes that are not receiving creators for uh, the, their creation. So it has raised real challenge for the fair remuneration of creators online. There are also significant gaps in the social and economic protection <coughs> that are not available for artists and cultural workers who often work in precarious condition with little access to social safety nets. I will not uh, take more long, but it's important that today, if we are not able to, to advocate, advocate for uh, culture as a common good that should be universal. And when I'm talking about universal, it should be accessing universally to all these uh, common goods. So today we have in our hands as um, specialized agencies that are working around the creative economy, the possibility to go a little bit further and not only to do the advocacy job that we have to do, but also to ensure that we are able to work with our member states to, to, to give the opportunity to put some of these projects uh, on the ground and trying to help in all the policy issues that are today in stake. Maybe later we could speak, but we have an opportunity as we had the G20 uh, this year uh, with the presidency of Italy, who are able to have the first official meeting of Minister of Culture with a declaration that was very strong <clears throat> and that was uh, taken by the, the, the high level authorities of the G20, putting for the first time uh, the point 53 that speaks about culture. And we will have in September next year the most important, the third intergovernmental conference, uh, Mondia Cult 2022, that will be on public policies in culture. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Sylvia, can we get your point of view on this? Yes. Um, uh, first of all, uh, let me say that when I see the beautiful screen that you have, I see that uh, creativity in the um, uh, uh, United Arab Emirates is already there. It's beautiful and, and we feel like as if we were with you uh, with this um, uh, setting. So uh, thank you very, very much. I'm very pleased as well to meet you uh, as I know very well your cousin and I'm very pleased to know uh, another part of the, of the family today. So let me just very briefly uh, introduce the fact that uh, why is it um, important for a country or, uh, or a region to have a thriving creative economy? I would just mention two things and I, I shall come back later on the substance. But first of all, it's the first time in the history that uh, we see sort of a common understanding around the world that the creative economy is a signal of a dynamic growth of a country and as well is seen. And if there is a, a very general consensus uh, that it's a development factor for a country. Uh, we have uh, an example uh, at WIPO, which is uh, very, uh, very interesting. Uh, we saw that uh, Republic of South Korea jump six ranks in the GII, the, the indicator for innovation, the, the global indicator for innovation that we publish every year. And guess what? Uh, South Korea has jumped all those ranks thanks to creative economy, thanks to K-pop, thanks to the, uh, the audiovisual uh, success that they have seen. So it's incredible that for the first time in these three, uh, a lot of countries can really benefit of this impact. The second thing that I would like to say is that for the first time I'd, uh, as well, 
and thanks to the uh, digitalization of the of the creative economy, um, when there is a, a very uh, a thriving creative economy, it gives chance and opportunities for the creators of the country to get to the global market, to, to be successful on the global market. And that is good for the creators, that is good as well for the country. It increases the so-called soft power, which brings along with the success a lot of good things for tourism, for attractiveness of the country, for uh, even uh, fashion. Uh, we see that. Huh? And it's not only uh, for uh, big countries like in the past, uh, the soft power uh, of the US or, uh, or any other developed country is the soft power of countries, developing countries, which is growing and, and, and uh, developing around the world. It gives, uh, it gives chances. We have chances now and we need to reach uh, this point for all countries in the world to have equal chances to get to this success and to get to those benefits. I shall come back later. I just want to stop here. Mm? Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Um, Ernesto, we heard the Director General of UNESCO, uh, Madame Azoulay, today talk about how important it is for the creative economy to be inclusive, how important data is for, in order for countries to understand how the creative economy feeds into their GDP. My question to you is, how is UNESCO currently helping to shape the global creative economy? I know you're very passionate about this. Yes, indeed. Well, you know, one, one of the, one of the issues that happened during the general conference of UNESCO of this year was that uh, all the meetings that we had with the Minister of Culture and also with the Prime Minister or Foreign Affairs Minister was that we don't have the necessary data to ensure for the future uh, the right decisions to be made. The culture sector has been one of the sector where we have a lack of information. And now that we are living in this very strange uh, moment of, 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 of the world with the pandemic, we see that less information we have, more difficult it's come to take the right decision at the right moment. So where we are working right now as UNESCO, uh, we launched one year and a half ago, and now we are working in more than 30 cities and countries on the indicators for uh, SDGs in culture. It means that we had to, to be innovative some way to ensure that those data about some indicator on the SDGs, especially on culture, that was not built. We had to build it because, as you know, there is no uh, specific uh, target for culture between the 17 goals. Uh, was to try to do it at national level and at the same time taking cities. So we can have a comparison on the same data between the local and the national. And that is uh, working since five, six months. We're gonna have for more than 24 countries uh, from all regions around the world, financed by some other member states that are helping us in, in, in seats or in Latin America or in Africa. And those data will serve to assess what are the principal gaps that we have right now on the SDG. At the same time, uh, after all the, um, the reports that we had during this pandemic time, more than two on creative economy uh, and industries in the 2005 convention, years on intangible, on world heritage sites, on creative economy uh, and industries in the 2005 convention, huge. Uh, data collection for the months of January, February. We are working since three months so that we can propose also a more comprehensive lecture of what, where, where was the world, because it's very global, before pandemic and where we're staying right now. So it will be the beginning of ensuring 
that we will be able to have those data. At the same time, what is important is that if we are not capable as uh, organizations, intergovernmental organization, and I'm not talking about UNESCO, I'm talking about all the organizations that works uh, with, the, with the, the culture as a framework, to have periodically meetings to evaluate where are we at the moment. And we can compare between data that we have recollected every three, four, five years, we will not be able to build, and I'm not talking about the momentum, but to build on the future and try to find the prioritization <laughs> that we need. This point was in the debate of the G20. It was in the meetings of Minister of Culture. I'm sure that in, in the regional consultation that will begin uh, in two weeks in Europe and will finish in Latin America in February for the prioritization uh, for the meeting of Mondiacult, this issue will come back because it's a need and we need to be a sector that can compare itself and have all the, all the data that we need. So it's the right moment to ensure that all organizations can help to build on this issue as best in their capacity as they can, but for giving us the opportunity uh, to be in the, in the fora where discussion on financing, but also on policy will be made in the next years. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. We, we, we're definitely looking forward for the report that will be released in, in March. I think that report is very, very important for any global economy that wants to pick up its creative industries, um, especially post-pandemic, hopefully. Uh, Sylvie, my question to you is, obviously you're responsible for copyright matters. What are the threats and challenges that entrepreneurs and creatives face? And how do you advise them to address copyrights issue? So, <laughs> allow me not to mention any threat, I think. I prefer the word challenges because I think challenges can be overcome uh, and, uh, and that's where we are helping member states to overcome the challenges. And the first challenge is I, I, the first challenge I would see is for creators uh, because uh, the moment where they are not uh, much aware of what they have, and uh, it's very important to notice that from the day of existence of the creative work, the authors are entitled to copyright protection. And knowing what you, what you own and understanding what you can do with your property, with your work, uh, gives you, of course, a unique position and a much better bargain, bargaining power if you want to access the, the market. And we are very much working towards increasing this level of understanding of our copyright, of your, cop sorry, of your, of the copyright of creators. And the new thing that you have to notice for our initiative is that we are conscious that Copyright is a very difficult, complex matter, which can be simplified in the understanding and has to be simplified, not in the mechanism, because the mechanism are very important, but people and even the creator in a very remote area, in a very small village, um, um, has to be uh, knowledgeable in this. And that's where we have created a public-private partnership, which is called WIPO for Creators, and which aims is really to put the knowledge or to, to respond to questions and to go, to, go to, to creators everywhere in the world and to give them easy answer, very useful answer in order for them to exploit their rights and to, to, to take the benefit of their right. The second challenge I see 
is more uh, at the level of policymakers and governments because there is a need and it's it's not done not everywhere i would say there is a need for policymakers and government to understand that creativity needs to operate in an ecosystem which is rather complex and that the conditions to for it to flourish need to be ensured through appropriate policy actions and appropriate infrastructure to be put in place. There is no magic wand. The creativity will not bring money, will not bring fruit, will not bring reputation by itself. There is an ecosystem to be built around and that's where we work uh, um, and that's what we, we do. I shall come back with your uh, next questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Uh, my next question is to Your Excellency, Ernesto. Um, you have a very diverse background, being a creative yourself. Um, we know that you were an actor, you're in academia, management and government. How aligned or not are these different worlds? And I think this question is more for the creatives who are sitting here. How much disconnect is there from policy making and the creatives? And how much should they be interlinked? Huh. You're asking me the question of my life. Basically, Why yes. I'm here now? Ay, ay, ay. No, look, uh, what is important to understand is, first of all, politics is creativity at the end. You are at the service of uh, people. And we should never forget that we work for people at the end, all the organization are working for the member states, but the member states are represented by people and communities uh, that wants to have better lives at the end, peaceful lives and, and a peaceful world. And it means that everybody who works in the creative field wants to give something to the society that can let for future generation a more diverse, a more expanded vision of the world. It means that the creation is part of uh, what we are trying to live for the future. That's, that's the meaning of heritage at the end. When we recognize a heritage or in world heritage, when we are looking for this uh, authenticity, universal value, it means that it represents something in the construction of civilization. Art is the same. And at the end, politics have to be innovative so that people can find themselves uh, in this path of looking for something big. And when I mean big, it's something that gives some sense to our lives. And that's it's all the job that we have to do. Uh, we had this experience uh, during these two years of, uh, of these crises that we are living right now, that was the movement Resiliab that we launched. It was a way to find the voices of creative community that could participate, giving ideas, giving knowledge, giving the experience on the ground of what they were living during this pandemic. We had more than 292 uh, debates around the world in more than 119 countries where we could receive more than 100 of recommendation of these debates. Many of them were also part of the policy that was put in place by the governments, local or national, to tackle the pandemic. But there were 13 or 42 that was on experience-based situation. And I believe that we should also seek for, seek for, for more of, of this, how I say it, knowledge based on experience of what today, what Sylvie was talking about, the ecosystem of the culture sector can give to authorities to ensure that the face of policy making is in line with the needs of those sectors. 
And those sectors doesn't exist in, in the clouds. Those sectors are preoccupied about their livelihoods, about their rights and the access that communities and citizens can have to participate fully and integrated in cultural life. So we don't have to do this division between creators or cultural workers and policymakers. Mm -hmm. I believe that once we achieve to have an understanding of what type of society, what type of diversity in the society we want and the intercultural factors that today can be the glue for social cohesion in our society and to achieve all the goals of the 2030 agenda, we will understand that culture is a common good. Thank you, thank you, Ernesto. Uh, Sylvie, this is a final question to you on being mindful on, on time. Um, we're obviously having this virtually, and um, this makes your job quite challenging, Sylvie, in the sense of what are challenges, I won't use the, the term threats, but what are challenges or opportunities do you see uh, IP rights facing the CCI sector in light of digital transformation and AI? I'm sure you are very busy with that, thinking of that. We'd like to know your point of view, please. Well, uh, I, would, I would put that uh, at large. Uh, of course, uh, as I said, uh, there is um, a priority for, for us, a conceptual um, point that we need not to, uh, to abandon is that um, the rights of the creators are totally uh, inside uh, the the fact of uh, creation and and the uh, what they do. Uh, I would say that um, WIPO uh, is very engaged, and we are as well very engaged in the work carried on uh, under the umbrella of uh, IP and the frontier technology. Um, uh, part in in the organization, and we take our uh, part of, of the of the research of the of the work uh, of all what is done, and of course AI is part of this. Uh, what we have as sort of um, founding principle in our work is technolo technological neutrality, and we have not to depart from this concept because it's very 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 important. Uh, to understand that copyright has, uh, has gone across a lot of technologies in, in the age and always has found its way. Mm? And IP is a sort of a, a, key, a key point, a key central point uh, in this, um, uh, uh, in this, all these uh, activities that are done uh, under this, uh, the new technologies. What we what we have seen in the in the recent past is that uh, we have discussed, huh, of course, uh, international treaties. Um, uh, what what are they doing with those new technologies? What are, what is what is the relevance of those international treaties? And and of course, we have seen that copyright protection in the digital age. Um, going going until uh, AI and the new tech and the new technologies that are coming, so that the treaties are based on concepts which are very robust and very much operational and very plastic. It's very important to understand that uh, we will manage we will manage uh, even through the new uh, technology uh, uh, revolution, which is brought by uh, artificial intelligence, we will come and, and, and we will see, uh, but the, the copyright and, and intellectual property, part of intellectual property is really at the core of those new uh, evolutions. And we are, of course, uh, looking at this, we are as well very vigilant uh, as, of course, new technology have to be tested over time, that um, uh, some of them as very uh, volatile. And, and of course, it's very, very important for us uh, to, to keep the principle, which is that uh, really uh, the 
the copyright the, the ecosystem based around copyright is a very uh, could 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 um, really uh, be useful in uh, uh, speaking of uh, in the, of artificial intelligence and all the technology that will come. Thank you, thank you, Sylvie. I want to thank you both for your time. Um, we hope next time to see you in person with us here. Uh, Sylvie, thank you for everything you do and for the wonderful work that you do at WIPO. Ernesto, uh, thank you for emphasizing the importance of creative industries on a global scale at UNESCO. And I will see you soon. Thank you both for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.